رہبر ملک و قوم ذرا آنکھیں تو اٹھا نظریں تو ملا کچھ ہم بھی سنے ہم کو بھی بتا یہ کس کا لہو ہے کون مرا During the struggle for an independent India, we lost the blood of millions who fought to overthrow the British rule, to break the shackles of oppression. Years have passed, but we are hardly aware of the revolutionaries who fought valiantly for our democracy. One such tale lies in the forgotten pages of time. In order to understand the origin of the Indian Navy, one must look back at the most significant incident that cemented the values of our naval forces. I am sure we all are aware of the first revolt of India's independence in 1857, but very few are aware of the uprising that shook the British from their very foundation, which paved the way for India's independence. Can someone tell me what incident am I referring to? Sir, the uprisings of 1946. That's right. The Royal Indian Naval Revolt of 1946. Well, to understand that, we must look back at India after the Second World War. India's multifaceted experience in the world wars led to a search for a new identity and a sense of belonging. The wars triggered a ferment that originated within the Royal Indian Navy. The culture within the naval forces was dominated by racial discrimination. The British enjoyed all edges over Indians. They received handsome salaries, sumptuous food, sophisticated clothes, whereas they suppressed Indians of the same ranks with meager salaries, rotten food, ordinary clothes, and deplorable living conditions. One of the crucial parts of this was the Bengal famine of 1943. There was a loss of three million lives. The ratings were part of the society which was affected by all of this. The immensity of the famine was because of negligence and speculation meant that they were that much more angry. And then to come back to a system where the food in the mess was impossible to eat and to understand that The food across India is in shortage, but at a time when they can barely afford to eat for themselves, Britain is supplying from India to Holland. This, I think, is a crucial dimension of the Aryan mutiny of 1946. Post-World War II, in February 1946, uh, practically the whole Indian Navy rose up against its British officers. They use it as one more evidence of its disaffection with the current state of affairs. The Indian Navy between 1943 and 1945 had expanded several fold. There were now 30,000 uh, ratings in the Navy, all waiting to be demobilized. Head of HMIS Talwar, which was a signal school, was a foul mouth Commander King. On February 8th, 1946, while the boys were busy dressing for their first parade, their commanding officer, Arthur Frederick King, entered the barracks. Get up, you sons of coolies! The young ratings, most aged between 15 and 24 years, escalated complaints against these mistreatments. Beggars can't beat choosers! the British officials responded. This arrogance of the British officers was a key incident that broke the long silence of many sailors. On the morning of 18th February, 1,500 ratings walked out of the mess hall in protest as a clear act of defiance against their oppressors. Popularly referred to as the slowdown, This event was the very first declaration of their rights. This is not a mere food riot. We're about to change history and rise up for the pride of free India. The ratings rejected the appeals of their officers, including Rear Admiral Rattery. MS Khan and fellow naval rating Madan Singh took control of the mutiny 
which led to the formation of the Naval Central Strike Committee. Hey, what are you reading? I'm reading a book on naval mutiny, 1946. That's nice. That's a topic I just covered in class today. Oh, really? That's so nice. Papa! Hello. Hi, baby. So tell me one thing. How is a mutiny justified in a defense setting? See, that's where we get it wrong. It has been branded as an act of mutiny by the then British leadership. It was not a mutiny. The actions of the naval ratings was just to showcase the solidarity towards the freedom struggle and it was a fight to protect their rights. Even in that matter, for instance, when the Indian National Army got disbanded, officers and soldiers of the Indian National Army were arrested. Major General Shah Nawaz Khan, Colonel Gurbak Singh Dillo, Colonel Prem Kumar Shegal were tried for treason by the British authorities at Red Fort. And they were not criminals, they were patriots who were fighting for the independence of the country. The strike committee was created because the Britishers told them, we can't be talking to 20,000 people. So you make a committee of representatives and talk to us. The Naval Central Strike Committee put forth a list of demands to their British officers. A list that went beyond their own needs. Release all political prisoners, including those of the INA. Take action against Commander King, commanding officer of the Talwar, for using insulting language against the ratings. Speedy demobilization and provision for resettlement in peacetime employment. Same pay scales, allowances, etc. as those of RIN ratings. Access to Nafi canteens, better food, no return of clothing kit at the time of release, and withdrawal of Indian troops from Indonesia. The protest spread rapidly to all the 11 shore establishments in Bombay. 60 ships in the harbour were on strike and nearly 20,000 naval ratings participated fearlessly in this act of resistance. The next four days saw hunger strikes, ominous threats from both sides, hijacking of naval vessels, the capture of 22 ships around the Bombay harbour. As a symbol of unity, the ratings removed the British ensign from each of their ships and shore establishments and replaced them with the flags of Congress, Muslim League and the Communist Party of India. The ratings asserted their allegiance with the freedom struggle with slogans like B.C. Dutt, Balai Chand Dutt and R.D. Puri, Rishi Dev Puri were the two uh, rating who wrote Quit India in Kalab Zindabad on the walls of Talwar. His Majesty's India ship Talwar, which was, uh, which was basically the communications shore establishment located in Bombay. So they had access to wireless uh, radio and which they used to great effect because they were, they were adept at using military communication systems. An unprecedented demonstration of solidarity sounded across cities till the message of resistance travelled pan-India. The public transport network was brought to a grinding halt. Trains were burnt and commercial establishments were shut down. On February 23, 1946, over 30,000 workers, students, Hindus, Muslims, all those identifying as true Indian gathered. The Britishers fired at them on the 22nd of February, so their rating had to retaliate. Uh, they were trained to fight for their rights anyway. So the British view was that this was a mutiny which was threatening to get out of hand, needed to be put down, needed to be quelled. The Royal Indian Navy was threatened with wholesale destruction. Quadrant of bombers was flown over the Bombay Harbour to intimidate the rebellious sailors and uh, ratings, but also the citizens and the people of Bombay who had gathered near the gateway of India to offer support. While the British military mobilized troops to drown the demonstration of the people in blood, the protesters stood their ground bravely, showing their commitment to the resistance. 300 civilians lost their lives, and over 1,500 were injured during the aggression. 
The RIN strike was not confined to Bombay alone. Karachi joined hands. These were two sites of fierce battles and heroic resistance. Within a day or two, the strike spread to every shore establishment and ship of the RIN within British-occupied India and abroad. It is uh, rather unfortunate that while generating popular support, the uprising did not garner the backing of prominent political parties. So the movement was rather leaderless and rudderless. Uh, the naval uprising was considered as you know just a one-off episode and not the continuation of a political movement. And the happenings in Bombay and elsewhere were looked upon as acts of indiscipline and defiance of authority by most of the political leaders of significance. The leaders realized that any mass uprising would inevitably carry the risk of compliance to centralized direction and control of India. Now that independence and power were in sight, they were eager not to encourage indiscipline in the armed forces. Ultimately, on 23rd February 1946, with the help of the national leaders, the RIN ratings were forced to surrender and end the so-called mutiny. No democracy, no freedom, only dependence and subjugation, not just subordination. All of these were brought to light in a whole lot of ways through the mutiny. This, I think, is the single crucial factor that led up to India's independence. Because colonialism is based on force in a whole lot of ways. When those on whom you depend to provide the force are themselves objecting to your use of force, then you cannot hold the country any longer. One always wishes to join any mighty service with zeal and retire with glory. Sadly, however, for several people in Castle Barracks, those who fought in the war got nothing but dishonor. They received a certificate discharged with disgrace from His Majesty's service. These honorable men walked out with heads held high to fight further and build a new emerging nation. They faced the tides of oppression with persistence. They were ready to serve the waves of time with honesty and commitment. The actions of the young naval ratings brings out two distinct narratives. First, a challenging set of circumstances leading to strike by naval ratings which resulted in trials and punishment. The second, that as a nation, we recognize the contributions of these brave young men who dared to defy the might of an empire and hastened India's independence. We commemorate this as the naval uprising. धरती की सुलगती छाती के बेचैन सहारे पूछते हैं तुम लोग जिन्हें अपना न सके वो खून के धारे पूछते हैं सड़कों की जबा चिल्लाती है सागर के किनारे पूछते हैं ये किसका लहू है कौन मरा ये रहबर मुल्क व कौम बता ये किसका लहू है कौन मरा